Thank you to Patricia and the staff and students of Queen's University, especially to Margaret Light, for this week together we're having, concentrating on the sacred art of Tanka. Thank you to my professional colleagues internationally. Thank you to our treasure caretaker training team of monastic and community treasure caretakers. Our board members, our paid and volunteer staff. Thank you to the Buddhist nuns, monks, community members, artists, and scholars who have graciously allowed me to interview them for this research since 1970. Thank you. Thank you to our funders, many individual donors. Thank you for believing in us and to our foundation and major donors, including the Pema Chodron Foundation, Kensei Foundation, Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, Shambhala Trust, the Oracle Corporation, Henry Ming Shen and Thomas Donahue, Terence Tai, and many, many more. Thank you. In 1970, I began researching sacred art in monasteries in India and Nepal and interviewing Buddhist teachers and traditional painters and sculptors. In 1970, I interviewed Gelek Rinpoche at Tibet House Delhi and Kangchul Rinpoche of Tashijang, the great painter and meditation master. In order to preserve traditional and evolving sacred art treasures, documentation and technical information is crucial to share it with this generation and especially with coming generations. Part of my professional work as an art conservator is consultation for museums on their sacred art collections. I am called in to work closely with museum staff for conservation examination and to document and design treatments and preservation parameters for tankas. My interest in tankas began in museums in the 1950s. In my second grade public school class, took a trip on the subway to the Museum of Natural History and we looked at their tanka collection. That museum is now one of my clients. Let's use tankas as an example of empowered sacred art. Conservators work with cultural heritage treasures from diverse world religions. A discussion about sacred art is so interesting because sacred is a definition that is intangible, and yet we are dealing with tangible objects, things that are made of atoms and molecules. A big question for people on a very personal level and on a professional level is what defines something in a material object as being sacred? Is there a line up to which it's not sacred and then all of a sudden it becomes sacred? What kind of ceremony or whom can transform it to become sacred? Can something happen to an object during its history that makes it either sacred or that erases its sacred qualities? People are really interested in empowerment for sacred. How, for example, does a tanka get empowered to represent the energy of its deities? If there's no inscription, can you tell if it was blessed? Is a newer tanka more blessed than an older tanka if it was blessed by a great teacher? If a framing or conservation treatment obscures the blessing seed syllables, does that affect the strength of the blessing? Our tank is still blessed if they have been in the museum for a century. And 
Does the application of science and preservation affect the sacred nature of tankas and other empowered sacred art forms? Especially because one of the foundational beliefs of Buddhism is impermanence. Since 1970, I have been interviewing Buddhist teachers on this and other profound and nuanced issues. I'm grateful to them for their patience with me. I research great meditation masters who are also master painters. It's a special class of tankas where a master paints a tanka from his own meditation vision. This is Kamchul Rinpoche, the eighth, who was such a master and painter. And he was very patient answering my questions in the 1970s. I'm fortunate to have encountered such masters and that they allowed me to interview them. Over many years, I've interviewed Buddhist teachers on many aspects of the meaning and preservation of sacred art. Here, for example, is the respected scholar, Gelik Rinpoche, who let me interview him for hours and hours. He was really interested in sacred art, but he's always also had a great interest in tanka fakes, how they're made and if they are sacred. Here's the respected scholar and meditation master Trunga Rinpoche in my studio here in Halifax. He's looking at tankas. He says, one needs to be aware first of the reason for tankas and other sacred art. Sacred art is not just for beauty. It's for teaching and developing inner wisdom and compassion. I think there's a point here because it's not meant just for decoration. In that case, a conservator is to only to stabilize and not go overly beautifying old lineage treasures. Buddhist sacred art in many areas traveled with monasteries, both seasonally, as still happens in Bhutan, and to offer teachings to remote areas. The tanka form is that of a complex composite object with wood, metal, leather, silk cotton components, all arranged traditionally into a textile mounting, holding a central iconographic panel. Tankas served as the text for many people who could not read, as a guide to their meditation visualization. The tanka form is not separate from the world of sacred texts. They work closely together, and most tankas, except for the rare kind, where a great meditation master had a terma realization and could also paint it. All other tanka iconography that you see comes from texts. The two work together. Some paintings are completely covered in text, front and back. Sacred texts are disseminated through the tanka form, as they have been for centuries. For example, Dodrupshan Rinpoche engaged a painting master to illustrate a lengthy Buddhist text he wanted to teach. He knew that his students were too busy to read the text. But many would see the tanka series illustrating the text, most likely in digital reproduction form. While the painter was painting this text, it took him three years living in the monastery. He also included a portrait of Dovdripchen Rinpoche to be included in his series of paintings for future generations. This is Dovdripchen Rinpoche, very humble, not fancily dressed, a wonderful person, brilliant scholar and powerful meditation master. And this is the way the artist idealized him for future generations, without his eyeglasses, looking younger, and dressed in really fancy robes. Again, 
Some paintings are completely covered in text, front and back. Through the science of light, we can make visible elements of text and iconography that have been damaged without harming the original tanka. Our translator friends really appreciate this. We do that with traditional texts also through the magic of light. Well, the tanka form does not rest easily in itself. The various components react differently to changes, for example, in temperature and relative humidity. So even if a tanka, sacred tank, were resting in perfect storage where everything was controlled, it would deteriorate. Furthermore, a life that sacred tankas lead can accelerate physical damage. One Buddhist scholar, a respected elder, is concerned about this. And he said, the tanka is a holy object. It's important for us. It's time for us to wake up. We're losing precious things. Everybody knows how fortunate it is to obtain precious things and saying they are precious and that they look precious, but it's important to care more about them. There is something in the energy of the tankas, he says. Tankas have blessings, and many great masters use them. This is a quote. These days, we see people disrespecting the tanka and selling it for money. When precious tankas are damaged, people don't know how to care for them. Unquote. Tanka conservation in monasteries is as complicated then as the tanka form itself. It's a complex composite art form spanning centuries and continents and still evolving. Even traditional and respectful actions in a monastery can cause physical damage to tankas. The granular surface of traditional tanka paintings looks like this. It would be as if you were flying an airplane over a field of jewels because they're earth pigments from minerals. So instead of being made into jewelry, they're ground up to be used as pigments. So you'd be flying over the surface of this painting. It would be like flying over a field of jewels. And the grind is according to the color. You would take the blue azurite and grind it finer to be a paler color. This represents an art form that has changed through centuries of geographical and cultural migration and is under rapid change as traditional artists can no longer access traditional materials like this and artists are exposed to digital technology. As a conservator, I endeavor to recover and preserve the original art form as well as its evolution to a virtual form that can be accessed and utilized differently by current generations. A form that was created and exists as digital files. Hand ground pigment suffers damage with rolling and rolling. What kind of damage will the evolution of sacred art forms suffer? Let's look at the evolution of the tanka form. This is a traditional tanka form, but the central panel is not a textile applique or painted. It's printed on a plastic substrate. This is a flocked velvet form of iconography that actually is different than a tanka form, and some people really like them. And here is a purely digital representation of a great teacher. It's digital from beginning to end. So it's really important that as conservators, we understand the evolution of sacred art forms and not cling to the original as the only sacred blessed object that has validity. 
For example, this is a picture of the head of a, a monastery in Bhutan. I really liked him. He's since died. It was an important monastery. He was a lovely, warm person. He invited me to his office. Behind him is his lineage tanka. That's his lineage tanka. And right next to it, and he has no problem with the two being near each other, is a calendar tanka printed on plastic with a deity. He sees no problem having them right near each other. As conservators working with sacred art forms, we perhaps can first stabilize the condition of the original and then reproduce the original by traditional and contemporary methods and materials. Copying in the tradition is, has been going on for centuries. For example, here's an older Amitayus and here's a newer one. I actually asked Tranga Rinpoche whether older tankas have more power than newer tankas, because I know in the question section someone's going to ask me that. He replied that many older tankas, quote, have been blessed by many great masters. Newer tankas may have been blessed in a ceremony but they don't have the level of blessings of the lineage that older ones have. Therefore, in his view, by appreciating their history and their sacredness, we would be motivated to show all Tankas very great respect in terms of how we preserve them and how we present them. This is an evolution of a figure of the Karmapa. This is a woodblock print that is very old and has been reproduced, reprinted, and it shows the Karmapa in his manifestation. And here on a monastery wall is a painting that was made from that woodblock print. And I have photographed this monastery wall painting of the Karmapa maybe over um, 1991 until now. So over many years to see what condition it's in. And recently, I asked a master tanka painter to create a tanka from this. So here's an evolution of this image from print to wall painting to tanka. And each one is different, but the iconography has been continued. Traditionally trained tanka artists and Buddhist devotees, both, are using digital media for purely digital tankas these days. For example, a monastery in Mongolia needed a set of tankas to illustrate a text. They engaged a Western digital artist to create the appropriate iconography on his computer and have the digital files printed out on a plastic substrate. They were sent to Mongolia where the printed digital paintings were sewn into tradi traditional Tanka textile mountings. The monastery had choices. They chose to do it this way. It could have paid a Tanka painter to create original paintings from the text, like Dodripshan Rinpoche did, and either his originals, or if they wanted prints on a plasticized surface that they thought would last longer, his paintings could have been photographed, printed, and sewn into the textile mountings. The effect of the choice of media and aesthetics does not appear to affect the ability for it to become empowered. As the newly created tankas, in whatever form, receive empowerment from a Buddhist teacher. The choice of materials and methods can affect the longevity of even empowered art forms. We try to interview and document techniques of creation, and we depend on scientific inquiry for further information on methods and materials that is so useful for, for preservation planning. We believe in digital restoration. When the condition of an original sacred art form is stabilized, 
it can be photographed in high density image. And a traditional tonka painter can, this is my favorite person who does it. He's trained as a tonka painter, but he's also really good with the computer. And so he created a digital image of how it might have looked before it aged during uh, blessed use in the monastery. He didn't try to clean the original and then repaint any damage. The original is just stabilized. This is a high density image of the original. And this is his digital restoration of how he, he thought it might have looked when it was freshly painted. And then this can be made into prints for people that want a copy of the original Tonka. It's quite interesting. I've discussed this at length with my Buddhist teachers. Perhaps this is better than trying to overclean and repaint originals. This, for example, was one of the most historic and beautiful Tonka images in a country. But it was overcleaned. It was so cleaned with water, then the original detail of the master was washed away. And then it got repainted using colors that were not original. It makes me really sad. We prefer to just stabilize the original and do digital restoration through the magic of pixelation. Never try to make a historic and blessed tanka look as if it were painted yesterday or today. Because tankas are not dirty and therefore cannot be cleaned because there's no varnish layer like in Western paintings. Severe cleaning and filling in missing iconography for a tanka because you want it to appear clear and new is never successful and you create permanent change and permanent damage. If you want a new looking tanka, have a new tanka painted. Please conserve historic blessed tankas by preventing damage. The tanka sculptural form, because it's very three-dimensional, is almost entirely an empowered art form. Whether the empowerment process is visible, as in this transmitted light photograph here. This is transmitted light, so it's this image seen from the reverse with light coming through so that you can see the location of the blessings on it. This has blessed handprints by the 16th Karmapa, signature, scripture, and seed syllables. This is a visible empowerment, or whether the empowerment is not visible at all. For example, I've seen a great teacher walk through a room of new tankas. He was requested to bless them. He had some rice. He flicked some rice at them. He said some prayers, and they were thoroughly blessed without any writing on them. Empowerment is an event that changes a painting into an empowered tanka. The thing about empowerment is that tankas get very damaged in their traditional and respectful use. And then you wonder, does this strength of the empowerment relate to the power of the teacher who empowered it? I'm coming up with questions that people have asked on this topic. When I asked one Kenpo, and I still do interviews, he said, quote, a teacher needn't be wealthy and own big monasteries to empower. They only need to be a good and devoted practitioner, unquote. What is sacred? I've surveyed nuns and monks in my preservation workshops and online, and some nuns were saying, handling is respectful in monasteries, but physically damaging, since the most fragile part of the tanka is the center. And in the monasteries, the tankas are gripped in the center. The painting gets damaged. This is an example of that. Again, 
physical damage that may occur to sacred art forms in a monastery is done in a traditional and completely respectful way. For example, a great Nyingma teacher, he was the head of the lineage, knew he was dying. So his wish was to go visit as many remote communities as he could and meet local community members and do blessings. So I was present there. This is a very remote area. And the whole community came in to this small local temple. You can see everybody, there is the teacher in his wheelchair. And the community members were so honored to see him one last time. He was their teacher that it did not occur to them that they were causing abrasion to the wall painting and that the tankas were being rubbed up against. That was not the concern. The concern was that they saw their teacher one last time. I think that's really important to mention and that's completely valid. Another thing is that in a monastery, sacred is within and without. For example, this monk, he was one of my early students in preservation workshops. He's since died. We were visiting a remote monastery and inside the storage area was a tanka that was the, the most blessed, the most sacred of any tankas in the whole monastery. But it was only taken out one day a year. So he was receiving blessings from it by placing his head on the door of the storage unit. The tanka is still sacred, even though it's not on display, even if it's in storage. This caretaker is showing immense respect to the tankas because he's covering his mouth with his scarf so that he's not breathing on them. These are the most sacred tankas in his remote monastery. But you can see from a physical point of view, the tankas are rolled and rolling tankas creates a lot of physical damage for the ground and paint layers and cracks the support. And they're kind of crushing each other with their weight. And he is also wrapping a, a ceremonial scarf, a kata, around them, around the painting part, which further compresses the ground and paint layers and the support. He's being traditionally very respectful. Sacred art in monasteries was rarely restored to the level that people do in museums. Only small men's were made to keep them as working objects in sacred art life. That was their function. Here, these nuns brought me a, a tanka from one of their nunneries, and we were doing some simple men's to it so, so it could go back on display in the main shrine room by request of their lineage head. Something that happens in, in sacred art in the monastery life that's very sad is ransacking. And statues and other sacred art in monasteries get ransacked because thieves want to sell, steal and sell the contents that are put inside them for empowerment ceremonies like Z beads and other and jewels and other things. They don't know exactly what's inside, but they're willing to ransack sacred art treasures to be able to root around inside and take out anything that might be sellable. It's very, very sad. This is recent from Bhutan, and I can post this. Most of the images are mine, but I can post this because it was on Facebook for the public showing that some youth went to temples and broke open statues because they were looking for sacred substances of value inside that were used for empowerment, like Z beads and some jewels, in order to sell them. This is really sad. Here is vandalism. And this statue was also uh, greatly damaged so that the thieves could get out the empowerment substances inside to sell.
preservation of monastery sacred treasures has to do with protecting against further damage. One way we do it is by risk assessment and disaster mitigation. We work with monks and nuns to preserve their own monastery treasures from within. Risk assessment is a model that's used all around the world for cities, and countries, for weather, for um, is this building going to hold up? Will the concrete fall down? So many uses. And I decided early on to apply it to monastery life, preservation of sacred art treasures. And I first did it in 2005, and it was very well accepted because monks and nuns and their community members are so practical that if I come up with a risk assessment category that is theoretical for someone who lives in the West, for example, earthquake, mm, you know, flood, I don't think so political upheaval. In a monastery, every single risk category happens almost every day. Therefore, in our sessions, every monk and nun comes up with experiences in their own lives, in their own monasteries about these risks. Documentation is really important. Documentation is taught almost first before the risk assessment, and risk assessment is done through documentation of the risks. These monks from Sikkim, one of our workshops, wanted to know the risks to the sacred treasures in their monasteries, and this is what they came up with. Rodents eat the treasures. A monk dropped things and broke treasure. Water erodes treasure when it comes in from the roof. Rain damages the carving. All of the risks that are theoretical in Western risk assessment are everyday events in monasteries. In monasteries, preservation of the sacred is a training that is sustainable. It's an approach because what happens is that the monks and nuns and community members we'd worked with early on well, starting in 1990, 2005, and onwards, now they're senior in their monasteries and nunneries and know this approach. And they're not giving workshops, but it's incorporated in their administrations. This shy nun in 2005 was just learning risk assessment before we had computers or cell phones like that. This nun was the most shy, and now she's a PhD student at Hong Kong University, one of their stars. There she is learning risk assessment. And again, this shy nun is now in our workshops teaching monks how to do risk assessment. We're very proud of her. Due to the fact we can't travel because there's a pandemic, we are publishing Preservation of Buddhist Treasures resource. It's free and online, and it contains all of the components of our workshops, including the importance of documentation, which is done within a monastery, and therefore it's confidential. Confidentiality is really important. And you're going to wonder why with sacred art treasures, is there no inventory? There's a number of reasons. Again, confidentiality. And there's a waning tradition of oral transmission. In other words, previously in the centuries, one caretaker would tell everything to the next one, but it didn't have to be written down because they knew that the next person would tell the next one it would go on like that. That's not happening these days. And also these days, the caretakers are moving on to other roles in the rota, so they might not be in that position long. This is a picture from a monastery in 1991, the, current, the caretaker at that time. He's since died. I worked at that monastery in 1991, 2005, 2008, 2012, 2014, 2016, and I continue to offer advice. The monks know, a very traditional monastery, that they can contact me anytime. It's usually done through social media messaging, or they call me up to find out about some element of preservation, storage, display that they need to know. Including 
Included, and it's very important, in preserving sacred art in monasteries is video interview of the elders who hold the knowledge of the history of sacred art treasures. If you don't interview the elders, and because no one's asking them these days, then in actual fact, the history of the sacred art treasures from a monastery could be lost. So I went with a group of participants. We went to a particular nunnery by invitation and we interviewed everyone we could. And I didn't do the interviews because I want them to do the interviews. And he's using a, an old flip camera, that's what we had. And we're interviewing this nun to find out about the history of her life and about the treasures that she brought with her to the nunnery. And we came up with amazing interviews, stories about the sacred art treasures in that nunnery that otherwise had never been recorded. Emergency planning and disaster mitigation is so important to preserve sacred art treasures in monasteries. Our book that's now free online to all monks and nuns, community members, conservators, artists, everyone, has the risk assessment chapters published currently. And the next chapter is going to be the 400 or 500 page Tonka preservation chapter. In the risk assessment chapter included are water damage, pollution and air quality, pests, human choices, and all of it is in response to questions from monks and nuns and community members and illustrated with pictures from their own lives. Theft, light damage, temperature and relative humidity, risk assessment, and I updated and keep things current by including earthquake during the Nepal earthquake, and I added a section on risk assessment for a pandemic so that sacred art treasures don't get damaged by hand sanitizer or by spraying, things like that. So for monastery sacred art, preservation comes through, preventing further damage through risk assessment, and planning ahead for disasters, learning how to protect sacred art treasures during a disaster. This, for example, this, there was no planning ahead and there was no risk assessment. So this entire monastery burnt down because there was old wiring. Everything was lost. Safe storage is so important for preserving sacred art treasures in monasteries. If you wanna learn more about risk assessment for monasteries, I really suggest that you could easily view this highly entertaining and beautiful webinar that I did with Buddhist Door Global. Thank you, Raymond. And it's about risk assessment in monasteries. It goes step by step. Let's go on and discuss sacred art in the museum world. In the museum world, sacred art encounters non-traditional aesthetics and presentation combined with the benefits of the museum approach to preservation. But is it still sacred if it's out of the original context? What do you think? I've asked many teachers about whether, for example, previously restricted images only available to see with transmission are now readily visible, readily visible for everyone in museums. Do they still carry their original empowerment? The general agreement is that for non-Buddhists, there is what's called the seed of liberation, which is planted to the viewer just by the virtue of looking at a blessed tanka. It's different for Buddhists. However, by contrast, in a different tradition, a respected Innu elder said, and this is a quote, when carvings are in non-Inuit homes, they have absolutely no power, just as the carver has no power over the spirits who inhabit the carving. From a physical point of view, some museums take excellent care of their sacred art. 
For example, this is the Rubin Museum, which takes really good care of its sacred art. And this is an ex excellent storage area. This is used by permission. From a physical point of view, museums can take very good care of art. But as a lot of monks I know who went to see this tanka in a different museum, don't like the way it's rolled up at the bottom. They don't like the way it's clinically presented and remote in this vitrine. And they wonder what this is. It's actually uh, monitoring the environment inside the case. But it has been seen as disturbing. And also that the ribbon is often angled like this. So it's a matter of opinion. Also, not everything in a museum is appropriate for sacred art. This is what's called open storage in the Museum of Asian Art. And the Buddhist statues are on floor level. And there's a lot of controversy about this for sacred art. It's really interesting for exhibits. For example, recent innovations in museum display are quite interesting in the presentation of sacred art. Not only as venerable historic objects, for example, what is real and what is not real, but what we're doing with digital advances, so to speak. This gentleman is an exhibit, at an exhibit at Hong Kong, and he's looking at a real artifact. It's actually real. And we're wondering if this is empowered. These young women are looking at a wall painting from a cave temple, which is totally a recreation of it done to perfection, really done well. And it's labeled as such. They did not rip it out of the cave to put it in the museum. This is a reproduction and it's just done beautifully. And then the same exhibit has digital projections of, of different deities like these Apsaras offering deities flying around the exhibit. And you do wonder if a Buddhist teacher would say that these are empowered or not. It's interesting that the, the beginning of conservation was a hands-on discipline, but now we have the increased use of sophisticated analytical tools and routine use of the digital toolbox. But now a um, profound mixture is found in museum exhibits of original objects, digital recreations, virtual reality, the permanent and the impermanent, including formerly blessed objects and they were highly empowered and they're mixed with the newly created. This is an example where a museum has recreated a shrine room and everything in it is presented with proper lighting, control of temperature and relative humidity and everything. It's a roof of museum, it's a beautiful job. And when people see this, they're going to a museum. But there's the question, is there power simply in seeing such, seeing this? Which would argue for the value of a museum display like this. And people talk about this a lot. They have meditation and session, sessions in there and Buddhist teachings in the museum. It's very beneficial for people who come, but it's not a church. Many people wonder whether the tankas they see, not necessarily in this museum situation, but in others, are alive or are they dead? I ask that of many of my interviewees. They're very patient with me. And I asked, for example, Minjur Rinpoche. And he said that the tankas carry the blessing, quote, until the four elements, fire, wind, water, or earth, destroy the image. I asked if there was method for removing blessings from tankas. He said that they'd have to be, those and tankas and statues would have to be burned or buried to actually remove the blessings. The sacred in the home and workplace. Unlike in a museum, tankas and other sacred treasures are an active part of our family and workplace culture, meant to be used and enjoyed at home, at work, and in the hallway.
the answer to preservation for sacred art objects in the home is a combination of the monastery and the museum approach, depending on the situation. For example, this monk is meditating at home in his family shrine room. This is very traditional. This picture from James Robson is from Hunan province and shows a home shrine containing blessed statues. Well, these statues are mixed, just like with Buddhist art, you could have Bun Buddhist and in Nepal, Buddhist, uh, Hindu. These statues are a mixture of Tao, Taoist Buddhist and, and many other uh, combinations and they're blessed. And one wonders which blessing of, from which tradition they are carrying. This is my friend Pauline showing me her family temple in Hong Kong. It's again mixed. Also, there's a mix of tradition in contemporary Buddhist painting and sculpture. This is Sering Sherpa. And he definitely uh, was trained as a Tonka painter and now he does traditional inspired contemporary art. And really you have to contact him to ask him if his contemporary art forms are blessed as his traditional ones were in the past. He's a wonderful person. This monk is definitely concerned with fake tankas and that historic blessed tankas are not protected and preserved. Let's talk about what a fake is. Well, we have this totally examined by advanced science, but there's a story with it. This was sold to me as a fake. In other words, I mean, sold to me, yes, I knew it was a fake. There I was in the market. And I said, I'd like to buy a painting. What do you have? He says, this is 14th century. You can see it's so dark and it's been, it's smoked by the monks, by their incense and their butter lamps. And it's, the price is so high because it's 14th century. And I started laughing and I said, you must be kidding. This is a new painting. You probably painted it yesterday and it smoked with your dinner of pork last night. And he thought that was so funny. He sold it to me for about $5. And indeed, this fake, which it's not a fake, because if only if I had bought it as 14th century would it be a fake. I knew exactly what it was. Examined, perhaps it had artificial soot. We were really wondering how it got darkened. And in fact, it could have been his pork dinner or it was also darkened with a manganese-based pigment. This fake was sold to someone. Uh, it's painted on a bed sheet, but she was told that the monks had to sell their most valuable tanka treasure to buy food. And wow, was she taken in. She paid thousands for it. And this fake was sold to someone who has no accurate iconography. As a conservator or as a collector, how would your approach differ for a tanka fake as opposed to an empowered object? And yet, as I explained the story of the Tara Tanka that was sold and created, created and sold as a fake, it eventually became empowered because it was used as a Tara Tanka in a huge blessing ceremony. And I explained to the teacher that it was uh, sold, made as a fake and he didn't care. So it became vastly empowered because it was the main power object in a huge blessing ceremony, the, the fake that was smoked with the pork dinner. So who's to say? That's why scientific investigation is so important. Let's go quickly through the scientific investigation into this karma patanka. This, it was given to me by a Buddhist teacher. This is how it came to me. This painting was quite old and it had been blessed many, many times before it was given to the teacher who gave it to me. The teacher who gave it to me had it sewn, the old, the old mounting removed and sewn into this 1980s brocade. 
which was doing no favors for the painting, either aesthetically, but it was stronger than the painting support, so it was damaging it. Being a conservator, I realized it was fine to take off the 1980s mounting and we would do some science on it. It had gone through an art dealer and there was a lot of uh, changes done to the original. Things a conservator would not do. In our scientific investigation, we used infrared, which showed changes in the position of both hands when they had been repainted. The infrared also, also revealed to us the artist, the master artist's original drawing. We used ultraviolet, which showed elements of the iconography not visible to the naked eye. And we did advanced analysis of the pigments, which are mostly all traditional. This periodic table shows the colors that we analyzed on the painting in their, the periodic table. In other words, the majority of the color of these colors would be the blue. This would be what the blue was made out of. This is what the green was mostly made out of. And this is where the traditional colors came. They were like jewels. And they were either made into jewelry or they were ground up as jewel pigments for traditional painting. These analyses were done by Jennifer Mass and team. Thank you very much. It, it really gives you insight into how traditional tankas were painted. These are not tankas that are going to be repainted to look new. We're leaving them just as they are. Through the science of light, we can do amazing investigation without damaging the original. This painting is, well, it looks very traditional and it's beautifully painted. It was well patronized, you could tell, because there's a lot of gold. And then if you look at it with raking light, which we use, you can see that it's like a field of jewels with the different grinds of pigment. And yet, let's use post-capture app, apps to see what else is going on. It shows us things that when we're carried away by the beauty of it or the beauty of the pigments, we otherwise would not see. It shows you elements of iconography and also elements of the construction of it as the sacred art form that you otherwise would not see. This is the science of light. It's causing no damage to the original. We use the science of light as we show, saw before to reveal text and elements of iconography that are not visible to the naked eye, it causes no damage. I'm glad to have this time with you, sharing my work with sacred art within monasteries and communities, being a resource for monks and nuns and their communities, I, mostly through social media. I get contacted several times every day with preservation questions. And I also work with museums and collectors and Dharma centers in the West, work on, the, on documenting the evolution of the form and creation of new forms. I so look forward to your questions about the protection of sacred art through conservation and any questions you might have about the sacred art forms that we encounter in our daily lives or in our travels. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I'm sure that everybody else is, uh, is um, silently clapping and applauding away. Um, and in fact, we've had some excellent questions uh, coming through the chat. So I'm going to um, just go back to the beginning. They've been coming through the whole um, talk, so we may be going back to some things from earlier in the um, uh, in the presentation. Um, from Michael O'Malley, he's asked, 
Um, do Tonkas that are older and that have received more numerous blessings mean that they embody a greater sacred quality? Yes, that's a question that only Dharma teachers can answer, and I have asked it. And there is a range of answers. Um, I'm not a Dharma teacher. I'm just, I'm simply a conservator, a scientist. And so on that level, I can only respond with uh, my research of what people in the know have said. And generally, the answer has been somewhat yes. Well, thank you. And, Michael and that's, why, that's why documentation of the history of a sacred art object is so important within a monastery. Because then you would know, you would be able to record that this originally came from this monastery. It was, it was blessed by this teacher to begin with. And then it was used in these Abhisheka ceremonies. And then it was blessed again. And this other great teacher used it in a ceremony. And then it was uh, blessed by another teacher. And the thing is that often that is invisible. So unless you go to the trouble of interviewing the elders about the sacred art in, their, in the monastery or nunnery and community, that history will be lost because there's uh, nobody's asking and there isn't oral transmission going on as it was for centuries. It's so important to answer your question and to preserve the history of the blessings of sacred art, art objects to do those oral, do those interviews, take out your phone and interview your elders. It's very important. Um, thank you. That's a great answer. We have a question from Ashley Mackin, and she said, Anne mentioned that tankas are not dirty. So is the soiling seen as integral to the life and history of the tanka? Well, you use the word soil. I think that we prefer to use the word evidence of historical use. It's the object as it is, as in, and as a result of how it was used as a sacred art form. It's also the object as it is, as it was stored and handled in the monasteries. And so you have the damage, but it's never successful to take a painting, for example, that has no varnish layer and that has been darkened with a combination of butter lamp grease and inset grit, which goes through the layers and pretend that you're going to clean it without doing great damage because there's no varnish layer. So that's not successful. So that's why we don't want to remove any evidence of uh, use in sacred art, sacred ceremonies. For example, uh, some people think that specks on a painting are fly specks and they should be picked off when in fact they might have been the offering substance offered by the chupa during a blessing ceremony. So, one has to be really careful uh, placing uh, the stiff and unrelenting aesthetic judgment of perfection that we've learned through Western oil paintings onto the physicality of an art form that is made totally differently and has led a different life. Um, wonderful. Okay, we've got a question from Maria Pereira who says, hello, I was wondering, how do you store the tonkas, hanging or laying? And what is a tonka considered before the blessing? Is it just an illustration? Um, and a third question, I can go back over these again. And who is allowed to learn to create tonkas? Could I, for example, become a, a tonka master? You could become a tonka painter. Whether you become a tonka master really is not up to you to say. <laughs> I mean, honestly, uh, I couldn't say if you could ever become a tanka master. There are even online lessons in tanka painting. For me to learn tanka painting, I learned in the 70s from a family of master tanka painters. They actually were tanka painting masters. If you go on Facebook, there's tanka painting groups, and a lot of people are learning to paint tankas, and that's excellent because they're becoming familiar with the iconography, and the tradition continues. It's not for me to say whether you could become a tanka painting master. 
Um, but yes, you could certainly learn to paint them. And I think it's a, a wonderful thing to do, actually, although the traditional techniques are um, have to change with what's available. The materials are available, so the methods have changed. Um, there are definitely more traditional teachers and less traditional teachers, and then you could learn to do digital tankas. And as for the second part of your question, according to all the people I've interviewed, yes, it's just a painting until it's empowered. And there was a question about whether they should be stored hanging or laying flat. Laying flat if possible. The ideal storage was one I showed you uh, with that image from the Rubin Museum, their storage of tankas. And it's an ideal that is, is hard to reach for even many museums. And certainly it would be wonderful for every monastery to be able to store their tankas like that in that it would be like a map case with one tanka per drawer, flat. But it's, um, that's the ideal. I showed it because it's the ideal. Flat storage like that is far better for the tanka form. Thank you. And Nikita Kuzman said, thank you for such a fascinating lecture. I am interested in the function of the curtain above a tanka. When should it be hanged down? When should it be lifted up? What are the functions of the two red strings that are, ha that are hung over the tanka? Thank you. Well, there are a lot of opinions about the covers and their opinions about the hanging tabs over the covers. One practical explanation is that there was a lot of dust and the cover covered the tanka to keep the dust out and those hanging tabs, uh, they have a slight, sometimes slight weights in the bottom, they kept the cover down. Another explanation is that if you have not received the empowerment in teachings to see a certain deity, then you really shouldn't be seeing it, viewing it. And therefore, if you were to go to a monastery or visit a Buddhist teacher and that image of the deity was visible in a tanka, they might put the cover down so that you would not view it because you weren't really entitled to see it because you hadn't received the empowerment. So there are different explanations for the cover. Um, from Rachel is a question, when a tanka is empowered without any physical sign of this, how is the knowledge of the empowerment or degree of empowerment passed down within the monastery? Is it done orally? Yes. And we're hoping that oral transmission continues. And, and because it's not continuing, it's really important that we do interviews. But if it's in a monastery, and serving the function of a sacred art object, then it has been empowered. Um, from Maria again, she said, also being composite objects, what's considered the ideal relative humidity for preserving tonkas? We're not talking about ideals here. I mean, uh, if you even ask that question, then you understand about the, the scientific limits of temperature and relative humidity. That's coming from a person who knows that. Um, in terms of, I'm more interested in the real life of the tanka and how to preserve them in the lack of control of temperature and relative, humi relative humidity and during the monsoon season and during an earthquake, planning to save it during an earthquake so that you have your disaster planning. In, in terms of a, a museum, type question like that, very few people can even control the temperature and relative humidity in their own homes. Yeah, I can see why that's not the highest priority in terms of preservations of, of, of objects that are housed in such a wide variety of locations and used so differently across different peoples and cultures and places. That's right. Um, Christy Corcoran has asked, I was wondering what makes a tonka fake since they can be made of all different materials and ages and are often copied. Do people fake the empowerments and blessings or is it the age of a tonka faked to increase its resale value? One chapter in, in our book, Preservation of Buddhist Resources, is all about fakes. 
and I have been researching fakes since the 70s, when actually the former Gaelic Rinpoche went on and on in uh, tell, talking to me about fakes. It was one of his favorite subjects. And then I got all fired up about learning about Tonka fakes since 1970. So I'm afraid that our time on the Zoom is about to end and we can talk about this another time. But to give you a summary answer, that there's so many different types of Tonka forms that the fakes also uh, copy them in so many different ways. For example, I showed you some example, some pictures of more obvious fakes. And so you can have fakes and it's defined as a fake only because it's sold as something it's not. You can have a fake in the high price market or you could have a fake painted on a bed sheet sold to tourists. It's the whole range. And remember, that small Tara painting that was sold to me uh, uh, and um, went, as a fake, he tried to sell it to me as 1400s, but I, we laughed. He sold it to me for about three to five dollars and it was smoked with his pork dinner. That painting, that was made to be a fake and he tried to sell it as a fake, but it ended up being highly empowered by a very qualified teacher and the major power image in a big empowerment ceremony for thousands of people. Um, we have a bunch of questions left. And how many more would you like to answer? Maybe just one. Maybe just one. Um, there's a, well, I'll ask a question about process. And then maybe if you can bear one more after that, there's an um, interesting one that's more um, uh, about ethics, I think. This question is about process from Kaylin Sarah. From the Tonka paintings on woven cotton, is it common or uncommon for ground layers to be applied? Traditional Tonka painting technique has application of ground on both sides. It was a process in itself, the application of ground, the ground on both sides. There was one layer applied and then it was polished with a stoner shell and then another layer applied and polished. It was a process in itself, usually traditionally in a workshop, the, the apprentices would do that. So the application of ground was fundamental for the successful um, completion of a traditional Tonka painting. Absolutely fundamental that the ground layer was applied and polished properly. And that's the reason, what, that's one reason why we have Tonkas from centuries ago, because the ground was applied that way. And another reason is because from a technical point of view, the yakai glue that was used in preparation of the ground and the paint layers was highly distilled by the apprentices. In other words, it wasn't something that you'd go to the art supply or the corner store and buy hide glue of indeterminate um, origin. No, they knew where it came from. As a matter of fact, years ago I interviewed, well, he was, a, a Rinpoche, a, a high Rinpoche, a high meditation master. And as a child, he had been sent to learn Tonka painting. He was a vegetarian. And his job as an apprentice, as a child, was to make the hide glue and to distill it. And he told me how revolted he was with the smell of the glue and how difficult it was to go through all those processes from regular hide glue down, distill, distill, distilled, till you've got an absolutely beautiful workable form of the hide glue that was meant for use in both the traditional grounds, again applied on both sides of the support, and in the paint layers. So it is through the proper and skillful application of ground to the painting support and the use of really refined hide glue that the paintings have come to us through the centuries. I'm not sure that the acrylic, the acrylic ground layers that are being applied now, and not even on both sides, which is traditional, and the acrylic paint layers will last centuries. I'm just not sure about that. We will see. I guess time will tell, won't it? 
there are lots more questions and I'm very sorry if I didn't get a chance to uh, to get to yours. Um, we have had Anne talking all day with our program. So, <laughs> so I'm not surprised that she's uh, ready. She's ready to wind up. So I just want to say once again, thank you all for attending. It was wonderful to have you here listening to um, to the lecture and asking all your really great questions. And Anne, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your knowledge and your enthusiasm and love for this topic. Um, we appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank All you. right, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording and uh, end the event. And thank you again. If anybody does have any follow up for this, please do email me directly. Um, my uh, my um, email is on the Queen's website, but it's p.smithin at queensu.ca. And uh, I'm happy to either pass your inquiry on to Anne or to do my best to answer it myself. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.